Hallo und herzlich willkommen auf der Bühne der Chaos Zone. Hallo und willkommen auf der Stage of Chaos Zone TV. Im Norden Brandenburg. Von uh, Fürstenberg, the Havel River in Brandenburg und Anker Domscheidberg. Is going to join us soon. He's, she's going to talk about the Bundestag, the German Parliament, uh, regarding the net political work and digital politi political work. So reviewing the last four years. And she would like to inform about the inside, about this, what we, something we watch from the outside. And I'm very much looking forward to this because Anke next to her political work is part of our team. So I know roughly what's going to come. It's going to be interesting. And we'll meet soon for the Q&A. We'll meet later. See you then. And from the interpreters, welcome to the talk. We are going to translate this. That is Sebelis and Lucas. Use C3 lingo as the hashtag. Yeah, and I will now talk about the, something about myself, say something about myself. I have a net activist, network politics activist background. I was a publicist. I've, I joined the German parliament in 2017. I got elected then. And before that, I have been spending a lot of time in IT. So I'm one of the few politicians in the parliament that had a lot to do with the digital before. And uh, I have now spent four years there. I've been re-elected this year. Uh, and it was quite a learning curve at first. And as I, I spent this time as the network political speaker for the left party, uh, parliamentary party. And of course, there are all kinds of committees that you have to staff. First, there are the subject committees, and they have a digital committee where I was the responsible person for the left party, but I was also the deputy uh, member uh, for the left party in other committees, the one for traffic, transport, and digital infrastructure, which included broadband and 5G license, um, mobile phone licenses and research and technology. I'm also a member of the Information and Communication Technology Commission that has nothing to do with outside politics, but about information about telecommunications technology in the parliament. What do the staff members and the members of parliament use and what their teams, what do they work with and hacker attacks, which don't happen that often, but it, ha it has occurred. I'm also uh, an advisory member uh, of the committee that uh, was uh, dealt with the licenses for 5G mobile networking, and I was also in the inquiry, Commission of Inquiry on Artificial Intelligence. A lot of expectations there, not many were fulfilled, but I'm not going to talk about that. So, this is one of the passages in the German Parliament, and I always used to uh, lose my way. This is actually one of the most recognizable passages. So to summarize, the Bundestag seems amazingly inefficient, very analog, and very chaotic, and it has a few uh, framework restrictions that are very annoying. You can't even have a drink let alone food in the plenary. There are no plugs for laptops. Laptops, laptop use is forbidden. And you spend a lot of time there. You have uh, sometimes you'd be sitting there, the agenda would have items until five or four in the morning, actually. Um, at one point, uh, there was only a five minute gap between the end of the agenda of the last day and the next day starting at nine, but many of the speeches are then just not held, but they're submitted to the protocol. But that's not a way you can work. I had to get used to fax machines. There are about 1,600 of those, I think, uh, in the offices. You keep having to send faxes. Just a short time ago, the system for submitting written questions to the government was only very a few weeks ago changed to a digital tool and Wi-Fi didn't exist. I remember when Wi-Fi was actually introduced in the Bundestag and if you come from the outside, this seems really hard to get used to at first. Now, the left party, as we all know, isn't part of government, never was in the German parliament and isn't now. So I am an opposition politician. And of course, that means you do different things than the government, you know, the party supporting the government do. The most important task is to control 
government to, to hold the government to account, but it's not very surprising. It, this is actually the task of all parties, but it's not surprising that the parties supporting the government are not as active as the opposition parties. And uh, I am a member of the only left uh, the opposition party on the left side is in this legislative period, which is going to be interesting. To create transparency is something I find very important uh, about how decisions are made, who influences parliament. You can't, of course, notice everything, but what I do notice, I would like to make transparent for the outside world. Uh, you could perhaps change the way parliament works. That is one of the goals I set myself. And the easiest way to do that is the Commission on Information and Communication Technology, where you can have a say in what kinds of open data are um, provided by parliament, what interfaces there are. And there's a lot to do there because progress hasn't been there hasn't been a lot of progress there. Gregor Gysi from the left party once said that opposition can work best if it can influence the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. You can try agenda setting uh, if you have a certain reach, if you talk to media, if you have do a lot of public relations work, and if you make sure that certain topics are debated in society to create pressure from society, but also literally set the agenda by proposing issues, uh, items for the committees to de debate uh, in the course of hearings, for example. And last but not least, I regard myself as the long arm of civil society, and there are a lot of things you can do to reach the certain goals. For example, you can submit written questions four times a month, that is limited. So every member of parliament can submit these questions. There are certain rules on that. The answers cannot be longer than 28 parts. So if uh, maybe if there are 50 answers that would come from that, maybe uh, 40. Uh, if, so if they suspect that the answer would be would require more than 28 parts, it will be rejected. It can only remain uh, contain one sub questions for each topic, and everything else, everything that goes beyond that, is turned is turned into what is called a small question to the government. That can be quite large. It can be 60 questions or something. The name is misleading. It, you can have sub items A, B, C, D, E, F or something. You can. Uh, but it doesn't really help to write hugely inflated small inquiries or small questions. You can also write standard letters, for example, to the agency, the, the German authority on, on the network and telecommunications, telecommunications networking. And as a member of the advisory board on the licenses, I was able to write a few letters there. Um, then, of course, the agenda in committee debates. You can try to set the agenda there also in hearings. But you can also try to get a certain certain values to, to be voiced there because you can suggest the experts that are invited to those hearings and what you talk about or what <clears throat> um, proposals you make, what, what that is something where you, where you can have a small influence on what happens. And of course, networking with the community is an important part because I get a lot of input from there for what I do. So what do you do? One legislative period, I counted. I held 42 speeches, submitted 137 written questions. I, it could have been more, but at first I was so busy just understanding how the parliament works that I simply getting around, didn't get around to do it. So I wrote eight of these small inquiries and the word cloud here contains the topics in these. I worked with colleagues from the parliamentary party. Uh, so that's 10 more of these inquiries that I co-signed and eight that I wrote as an initiator. There was one draft law um, and 44 reports from committees, which I will talk about later. And I also say why I do that. I would like to tell you a bit more about the content. In those four years, that was an immeasurable amount of issues. Uh, so I'll start with the issue of IT security 
And the question that has got me busy, kept me busy over several years, how secure is the parliament's own IT actually? So that affects hardware, software, but also competency on IT security. And of course, I was interested in the state of things uh, looking outside, not just the parliament's own IT, but what does the federal government do for IT security outside? So I had a, a written question that I submitted in 2020. And to summarize, I'd like to say, I think I can say that the federal administration, administration itself is a security risk because obviously it doesn't have enough competency. Far too many government positions uh, in, in ministries and subordinate departments are not staffed and those that do exist uh, so there are far too few positions and many of these are actually not staffed and of course it's hard to find the people to, to take these jobs and you don't get tend to pay so well and if you just select by former criteria um, if you just have to submit the right certificates it will then be hard to find good people on the market so every fourth job in the uh, government and its uh, subsidiary authorities or departments is not staffed and in the lower departments it's even every third job and many ministries have less than 10 jobs for IT security, 5 or 14. I don't think that that's enough. And the media picked up on that at the time. This is the German public broadcaster ZDF. And I found this unbelievable at a time when ransomware attacks are a daily norm. And the uh, German uh, agency on IT security talk, reports so many weak vulnerabilities every every day almost and all kinds of players in society are targeted including government departments then you can't do something like that can you so one year later February 10, 2021 is where we're at within the pandemic of course I resubmitted the same question and lo and behold the same Every fourth job has not been fulfilled, but something has changed. More than 700 jobs have been created within that one year. So they recognized the value of IT security. More positions were created and almost 700 were actually filled. So it's more or less the same number of newly created and newly filled positions, but there is an incredible imbalance because 86% of these new jobs were created in the defense ministry and their surroundings. And the same goes for the new, new um, positions that were filled, the new hirings. So only 20 or 15% of these are in the civil uh, sections of government. All the other departments, ministries, be it social services, pensions, they share 14% of the newly created positions. That is such an imbalance, I think, and that is just not on. So who holds the negative record in unfilled positions? With, in the middle of the pandemic, Jens Spahn, the then health minister in both these inquiries, 2020 and 2021, he only has 11 jobs. And of these, 80% are currently not staffed. So only since one year, two actually are the two are filled because, of course, they only have little things like electronic uh, patients file, uh, Corona apps, all these huge projects where privacy and data protection and security of health data is so vitally important. And he doesn't have the people that can judge when something is commissioned to the private sector, whether it's done well or not. It's completely unacceptable. But people are hired, people are sought, and the uh, BND, the Exterior Secret Service, the Foreign Secret Service, are looking for a cyber programmer. 
male, female diverse, they've come that far. But you then ask, what the heck is a cyber programmer? So I thought I can ask, I have four questions that I can write every month. So I wrote this small letter, a written inquiry. What does the German government understand to be, uh, what, how does the German government understand the German cyber programmer? The answer was very small, a very simple. Uh, focus and the profile of the cyber programmers you can find from the uh, hiring from, from the job application to the job posting that you know of so no you further insights cyber 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 but that doesn't make a good digitalization so how good is the hardware um, you remember in the last legislative period there were the extremely widespread hardware gaps, vulnerability spectrum and meltdown. So let's ask, I thought, what is the share in absolute and percentage figures? I thought I could ask of the hardware that is potentially vulnerable in, owned by the federal government to these two vulnerabilities. Uh, and what ha measures have been taken that really are effective in protecting? And I said, please break it down by ministries and lower departments. And there was a very typical response, strange kind of response, but that's how many of these answers are. They just don't answer what you ask. They simply leave it out. Even if you complain, you don't get more detail. So 100% of the computers of the agency on in information security are secure law. You can speculate why the others have not been mentioned in, in the... So chief information security officers don't seem to exist in the federal government. You can uh, also conclude that from a small inquiry with my colleague, Victor Perley, where I asked what kinds of server do these people use? What's the maintenance situation? And it turns out that many of the departments still work with Windows Server 2003. This was in 2019. And that extended support for that was actually ended in 2015. But that wasn't the worst. They actually said that there were had servers with Debian 3.1 that were still in use, where the last security updates at the time of the reply was more than 10 years ago. You you really don't worry, you know, I'm not surprised about anything after that. But you hear about more things where you can say you could, it could unsettle you if you think about this. This is the government, it's authorities, departments that uh, deal with all our data. If you know that there is no kind of professional life cycle management anywhere, so they they, that would make no when does not do maintenance periods or support periods end? When do you have to find replacements? That doesn't exist. And for example, the network of the federal government that should be particularly secure in transporting data from A to B, there are components there that for years have had neither maintenance nor replacement parts. It's just, just impossible, really. Well, they can. Or so you think. But I said I also want to tell you what the federal government, or the old one, the Great Coalition, has done looking outside and not just inside. And there was this IT security by law. We've waited for it for years, and it still happened, kind of. So there was the IT security law 2.0. Um, and the report from my uh, parliamentary committee looked like this on its starter page uh, because there was a hearing and at this hearing um, each parliamentary group sends their experts including the uh, grand coalition and they sent their own experts and even their experts um, completely took apart this IT security law 2.0. The CSU one said verbatim, it's kind of an anti-IT security law. So that was not very nice and it definitely belongs in the bin. It contains a lot of weird things which don't really have anything such as the IT security uh, seal. So kind of like the energy labels you have on fridges, which you hopefully look at before you're buying them to see if there's A or B. But this um, mark is 
different because it is a voluntary b um according to the company's own declaration so they say oh i have a nice electronic radio here it's super safe i would like to have the energy label a for it security sometimes occasionally it's supposed to be uh, controlled but according to the paper trail and i asked at some other opportunity at the uh, interior security cyber security thing if they think you might have found security vulnerabilities based on the paper trail before or based on documents and because they uh, ought to know what they are talking about and they said nah not really but that is the intended process here so uh, you declared yourself according to the company it is voluntary anyways so only the ones who feel up to it will do it and if it's tested at all, it's checked based on the documents. So, of course, you're not going to find anything there. So, of course, it's not surprised that according to the EU Cybersecurity Act, the trustworthiness of this label, which has yet to be created, is going to be low. And so the Great Coalition sold us this as, finally, consumers know when buying which products are safe and which aren't. Yeah. Then. Uh, so this is why this uh, law was um, frozen for a year. They kind of wanted to um, ban Huawei products in a very complicated way. You can't do this directly, of course, and now it was done differently. So this is for just for core infrastructure. And the experts said you can't really do that, but that's still in the law. And there's a lot of things that are not in the law, uh, which are things that it would have needed to be a real benefit for IT security, such as um, if the toaster burns your house, then there's an obligation on the manufacturer because that's not supposed to happen. But if there's an IT security leak, then there's no kind of responsibility for the manufacturer. And nobody can understand why there's supposed to be this obligation in one case and not in the other. And this, of course, means that the company is going to be um, more sloppy in the IT security because there's no consequences. There's also no requirement for updates. So I bought a cheap product and then maybe there are no security updates at all or for one or two years. If it's for one or two years, uh, no, if I buy a new smartphone, I don't want to do it every one or two years. But if there are no more updates for my smartphone, then that's an IT security problem. So it would have been a very important rule for consumer protection, and this did not happen, sadly. And the uh, uh, agency for cybersecurity did not get more independent either. Um, it was promised, but not really specifically. And then, of course, um, because it always happens with other security laws, but it didn't happen here that the previous law had been evaluated. So you didn't even know, did the previous law help? And in which places did it help? How much and where did it not help? And where might it even have done damage? This was not evaluated. It was just replaced with a new one and uh, expanded. And also there was no participation of third parties. It's supposed to uh, include some participation of civil societies and the economy. There's some kind of process there, but it's not really a participation process if nothing happens to the law for one year. And then in four weeks before Christmas, there are four drafts in sequence. And then the last one, the most important one, has 24 hours of uh, deadline for comments where the one group said this is a middle finger into the face of democracy. I thought it was very nicely phrased. It goes to the point, but even industry um, associations like Bigcom who have people on staff full time to comment on laws like this, and they said you can't do it like that. This was fairly often with the telecommunication process, also in the same four weeks resubmitted. And there, there were over 400 pages and you still only had one or two days to comment. And that's not only some an issue for the civil society, but also for the industry, because they're supposed to comment on it. And uh, members of parliament are also supposed to debate on this. And they have only had two days to read it, in most cases, even without any summary. So nobody tells you on which side, on which page anyone, anything was changed. So you're supposed to find that out yourself. So the 
uh, traffic light collusion is supposed to change that as well. What also didn't happen in this law is to decriminalize IT security research. We've um, seen this recently uh, in the um, when the CDU sued Lilith Wittmann because uh, she showed there were not only security holes but security barn doors and it's not it can't be that IT security research is criminalized like this and this would have been really important um, because then you can report um, security vulnerabilities to the developers responsibly all right how does a typical dialogue with uh, coalition representatives look like so there was um, an expert no there was a report saying that ransomware attacks are the greatest threat for IT security so I asked Seehofer the minister who was a guest in the um, commission what's your strategy regarding this especially great threat and Seehofer didn't have to think for a long time he immediately knew what a strategy is which is no tolerance uh, so that's what he said for refu about refugees at the border. But what on earth is zero tolerance supposed to mean as a tolerance against ransomware attacks? So if uh, someone sitting in Thailand and has a ransomware attack uh, started remotely, what is no zero tolerance supposed to mean? And how does it protect anyone? What does it change? So. Uh, sometimes you really don't know what you're supposed to reply to this and I'm sitting in that um, commission and can really only face farm a second example I was also busy with the interest in the subject of how sustainable is the federal IT and what does the federal government in this case the old one do to combine sustainability and digitalization and digitalization is also a great driver for CO2 carbon footprint. Uh, it's supposed to cause more carbon or CO2 than the um, international air traffic, and that's an exponential growth. So I also sent a very large, uh, small inquiry there with 42 individual questions and sub questions asking about all kinds of things. And there again, uh, you can have verbally the greatest things. So the federal um, environment ministry had a 70 point agenda which read fairly well but which had nothing to do with what happens in reality so that was just uh, the environment ministry and i asked what happens with the 70 measures so i asked can you please for each of the 70 measures tell me what's the current status which milestones were reached not reached of course they didn't do this um, I wanted to know what happened to these um, recommendations for acting also from this own uh, environment ministry what happened to the data center register um, for federal agencies but also all data centers in Germany are there any planned minimal efficiency criteria like you know for um, by building houses for instance is that planned I asked about uh, kind of the blue angel for data centers or for software uh, this does exist um, was created by this federal government this blue angel do they have that themselves do they want to have those for their data centers so uh, all kinds of questions like this and it was kind of remarkable I'm used to a lot of things after four years how bad answers of the federal government can be to fairly simple questions and that not all of those questions were simple but one of my first questions was how many data centers does the federal government have please split it by ministry and the uh, further uh, agencies I had asked a similar question earlier on its own how many data centers does the uh, federal government have again ministries and everything and I got an answer there I will show it now at the time December 2020 I'd asked this and the answer was 177 but now I've asked again in question 10 of this small inquiry um, fairly similar question how many data centers does the federal government have uh, I would like to compare this and suddenly there were only 110 so if some got lost 
on the way. And then I asked a lot of detailed questions, such as for each of those data centers, I always wrote the data centers mentioned in question 10. Do they have um, cooling coolants that are uh, damage the environment? Do they fulfill the Blue Angel criteria and everything in between? So you would think you would see the same 110 uh, data centers, but there were only 107. So maybe they left out three of them, but they didn't. So they named some of them twice. If you what you notice, if you go through, but they weren't the same ones. So if you look at it closely, you notice that the in Ministry of the Interior had 2020 with my single question. They had 85 data centers for themselves, and in question 10 of my small inquiry, they had 14. And in this table, where I asked for the details of those 14, there were none at all of the interior ministry and they were all gone or they didn't know anything about them i don't know they didn't say the i think there's the economy ministry they had it the other way around a year ago they had 12 ministries now in question 10 they had 10 but in the table they suddenly had 27. so 17 data centers somehow appear there out of thin air between questions 10 and 12. I do not know how to do this, but just for fun, I checked for each ministry in this question, in the same uh, or answer on the question, took the smallest answer and the, the smallest number and the largest number and thought the federal government has something between 77 and 110 uh, data centers. We don't know exactly how many. And the defense ministry, so I also asked how did it develop over the past few five years and the next five years was the plan and the defense ministry only could give the numbers for the current year because they didn't know how many data centers they had in 2020 or 19 and they also don't know how many they will have next year no idea so you don't plan in the defense ministry apparently weird very strange but they also no, don't know a lot of other things. So I said in this long table, there were 107 data centers, which were listed individually. 21% of those had no answer or the entry, no answer about the energy usage. And with the next question, is the data center operated by ourselves or is it outsourced and someone else operates it? They don't know that for 21% of them. They don't know if they operate the data center themselves. With almost 40%, they don't know if they use the waste heat. With 44%, they don't know what kind of coolant they use, if they damage the climate, no response. And for more than half of them, they couldn't say what the proportion of green electricity is, or if there is any in the data center. And also they couldn't say whether it fulfills or if it has this blue angel or fulfills the criteria for that or any for every second data center and those which uh, for which they specified data i looked at those closely of course and it doesn't really look that blue angel-y so only seven of the 107 data centers use this um, waste heat oh, we can assume that the ones where it didn't say they aren't the greatest one, I would just assume 48 out of the 107 use coolants that damage the climate, which is what they said themselves. I asked, do they use uh, climate damaging coolants? And they said, yes, 28, only 28 have 100% renewable energy and not a single one fulfills these criteria of the blue angel for data centers even though the this federal government came up with this blue angel themselves so that is um quite some something to manage i also asked of course does the federal government plan minimal efficiency criteria for data centers and the answer was very typical because it says something like data centers are very complex systems and yeah of course and then a very beautiful sentence here the technology development driven by the market was also so dynamic so far with the uh, computational power of servers that a regulation would not have added any value here so you don't want any minimal criteria you could have also written that but it doesn't add any value believes the uh, great coalition but we remember this uh, uh, voluntary 
security label. Now we want a voluntary energy label for our data centers. So I don't think that is going to save the climate. Transparent. Um, da komme ich gerade zu einem ganz anderen Thema. Ist die Politik? Yeah, and transparency, which gives me gets me to a very different topic. Uh, I did say at the start that I considered my task to create transparency about how the Parliament takes or thinks. So I have all these questions I submit, and I uh, had all these. I, I've called for committee work to become public, open, and that was always rejected. Um, um, some, sit, uh, some sessions were changed to public, so you can actually follow them via a live stream, they say, but that doesn't actually mean live stream, because there are only two options or two spaces for parallel live streaming in the parliament, but many more events like hearings or sessions. So you have the live stream on Tuesday and on Thursday it is being broadcast. So there is no kind of interactivity that way you can actually, uh, as a citizen, citizen submit any responses. That is not possible. And if committee work is as close as that, then maybe someone is interested, I thought. So let me try to live tweet about it, I thought. But I um, I would um, also write reports about the uh, media reports about uh, my work in the committees and uh, report about the previous sessions. For example, there are videos about the IT security law, about state trojans, about uh, micro-targeting in cookies. So these videos are 10 to 15 minutes long, and I think they give a fairly good insight in my committee work. I also try to be transparent in other ways. As I've said, I come from an activist background, and my focus before I was elected into the parliament was the issue of open government. How do you conduct politics and government work in a more participative way, um, in a more open way? And on my own website, sadly, there is no rule compelling members of parliament to do that. But on my website, I publish who I meet, uh, what side earnings I have, uh, how I donated these earnings, and uh, what I earn. Um, so you can all look at that if you're interested. And you can't, of course, work alone in politics. It's if you want to do serious work, it's, it's just impossible as a representative of the people, which is how I consider my role. So I am not just there for you, but I also need you, you for my work in Parliament. For example, several times I had experts that I invited from the surroundings of the Chaos Computer Club to hearings that would help me. Uh, I also received briefings on all kinds of issues, be it the Corona warning app, IT security, this cookie topic, the right to fast broadband. I got, I received input from you out there sometimes to prepare my committee work. I would say, this is what is going to come up. Uh, is there anything you would like me to ask? I then uh, took these questions into the sessions or for written questions, I received suggestions from the sensor community, for example, uh, when it was about environment data, I, would, I was happy to ask that questions. And that applies to you too, if you have cool ideas about written questions and other issues, that topics that should be covered, write to me. The contact data will, of course, come up at the end. Uh, also, my, uh, my small inquiries, uh, I received inputs, and sometimes I discussed, uh, I got advice. Uh, and I need some background sometimes for an interview or something, say, on a topic that you're not so deeply into. If you get papers that you find hard to understand and you need deep expertise, 
möglich machen. But you don't want to do this in a superficial way. And there it was extremely helpful to have the um, Lilith help me in the online access law. Um, when it came to vaccination certificates, Bianca Kastel could tell me everything about digitalization in health services. You probably saw her fantastic talk. The Luca app, there was a whole team there. Honk Hase helped me with cybersecurity, and there was an endless list that I could read out. But thank you very much to all of you. Without you, it would not have been possible. A small example, in early 2021, I tweeted about the Digital Committee, the President of the Authority on Protection of the Population and Disaster Relief was coming into the committee and asked what should I ask him. This was supposed to be about the Nina app and the warning day when alarm systems were tested, which was quite a failure, and there were interesting responses. How about the cell broadcast? When will we finally get it? And of course, the EU has the EU alert system where they, well, they, they set the guidelines that uh, system has to be in place by 2022, something like cell broadcast, nothing like that is in sight. So what actually went wrong? With this warning day, what are the consequences? Uh, how about what happens if there's a larger power cut in the mo mobile uh, network? Uh, do they have uh, uninterrupted power supply? And I had interesting, I found out interesting things. For example, the federal level and the federal state level had not aligned their procedures. The idea was that someone presses a button at the federal level, but the country, the states had to press their own buttons as well, and the districts had to press buttons as well. So there was quite a chaos, and the system was overloaded. Google and Apple uh, were supplying these systems. Uh, no one told them, and they thought, OK, millions of messages, this must be spam. They throttled that, and that isn't quite helpful if time is of the essence with warning messages. And it turned out that the system, the whole system, had never been tested in a re real-life test environment, and that was in January. The warning day had taken place in the summer before, and they told that, that then, in January, they were about to develop such a test environment, but it would take until the end of 2021, so 12 more months, for it to be finished. And then I thought, that is strange. Why? We had the warning day in September. Why? And you know why now? Oh, you're supposed to have the warning day in September this year. How is that possible? And of course, then the warning day was cancelled, the rep repetition of the warning day in 2021. So things like that are all in my video reports. This one in the report from the 1st of February 2021. And then, of course, we had the floods in Germany half a year later. So you would have liked to have the one catastrophic warning system, disaster warning system or other in place by then. So I asked what had become of this cell broadcast, because in January in the committee, I'd been told that they're just in the process of trying, but the telecom providers would say, this is expensive, millions of euros. And I thought, well, maybe half a year later, they know something. So I wanted an update and asked for it. And the answer was, we are still verifying, still looking. That was the decisive. Since the government is checking how an implementation of Article 110, and that is the EU alert, uh, either directive or regulation, this cannot be done overnight. So they're checking how the Article 110 can be implemented and how under which legal framework conditions uh, an obligatory, obligatory introduction of cell broadcasting would be possible. So that was six months later, and that was frustrating and very, very typical. I can't tell you all the zillions of details, but it was quite a struggle. And then, of course, we had something like, well, this pandemic, right? And that, of course, changed work in Parliament a lot. Some committees were notoriously holding their session in an analog way. Uh, the digital committee 
angefangen hat. That would have been strange. So they were the first to have digital sessions and there were very few options of teamwork, too little, just too few provisions for uh, telephone conferences, uh, not enough. Uh, there is a parliament cloud, which is still not functional. I still use it because it's even worse to have no cloud at all, but to co collaborate in a productive way is very hard in with this system. And of course, you have a lot of incompetent people to deal with. Uh, the head of the committee perhaps would say, digital, no, I don't like that. And they decide whether it's hybrid, the sessions should be hybrid or analog or digital. So you might be finding yourself explaining what a video conference is and telling them, you can just write into the chat if you have a question and you would have questions, what is a chat? What is a chat? You really don't know where to start. And that did not happen in the digital committee, fortunately. But due to many sessions being cancelled, you had a bit more time to go back to your constituency. And uh, of course, there weren't so many presence events there either, but I was active in the Verstehbahnhof, um, uh, the digital classroom in the uh, understanding station. Uh, we built the digital classroom in the basement there and the photo here uh, where I work on that wall here. Um, this is the wall that I am behind right now, in front of right now. And uh, you don't see what I see if I look forward. So that's where I am right now. And you see a few pictures from the space in the Verstehbahnhof and a temporary production site for face visors. This was as well. Now, with the new legislative period, of course, the uh, grand coalition that we had is thankfully now over. We have the traffic light coalition, red social democrats, yellow liberals, and green the Green Party. So we have issues like digitalization and sustainability, e-government, uh, uh, I want to observe what's happening across the nation. IT security uh, becomes an, is still an issue, digital education, and machine-readable parliament. This is something I would like to have in the information and information and communication technology. I would still like to be a member. It hasn't been uh, decided yet, but I'm pretty certain that I'll be able to represent the left party in that. And if the coalition treaty yields uh, certain issues of digital politics, of course, there's always nice things in coalition treaties and the issue is what comes out of those treaties. So I will look at that and keep observing and keep accompanying that. And that gets me to the end. I a very fast ride. I can say even as an opposition politician, you can influence things. Maybe you cannot pass laws because you don't have the majority, but you can have an effect. You can make a difference. I can't do it alone, of course, but you are there, you help me. And for that, again, I would really thank you for four years of support by you from, for my work, which you hopefully will gain from as well. And that gets me to the end. There are some contact details here, and I'm now looking forward to your questions. All right. Hello. Okay. Here we are. Here we are back in the Verstehbahnhof, uh, now in color and synchronous. Uh, that was an interesting talk, Anke. There are many questions in the pad. Um, now, the most obvious question, of course, is about food and drink. Uh, and, of course, you can't really imagine the question then. If you, as MPs, cannot change that, who can? Who is responsible for changing this and why hasn't it happened yet? I wish I could answer this question really in a really good way. Well, there are, of course, answers. One of them is that the Council of Eldest is uh, responsible for it, which is formed out of um, members of parliament, so they have it. Uh, can't do it themselves. 
But I think the fact that some members of parliament are okay with not being able to drink in parliament is that they've gotten used to it, or too many of them think that's normal. And if when new people come into the parliament, they think, huh, what? But Wolfgang Pubicki was vice president in the last legislative period already, and he was extremely upset when he was in the uh, presiding council, I think. And one or two days earlier, I tweeted about how stupid I think this um, water ban is, and two members of parliament had fallen over the previous day. And when I was in front of his eyes the next time in the plenary, he interrupted the debate, talked to me, and said, this member of parliament, Anke Domscheit-Berg, wants to turn the plenary hall into a um, dining hall. And what can you say to that? It's completely absurd. What I've just told the Council of Elders is that there is a small cafeteria in close to the plenary hall, and when there are six to 700 people there, that's a cafeteria with uh, maybe space for 30 people to eat, and that's not really enough. And if you haven't you can't get uh, bread already after at 9 30 or 10 30 and i made a formal uh, complaint there to the council of Ellis. you need to have water to concentrate to drink something and so this is something of a personal project in this legislative period and i would say uh, it's looking promising the new president of the um bundestag the uh, follower of Schäuble, Bell Bas, was a guest in the left uh, parliamentary group, and we asked her, of course, what does she think about drinking water in the parliament, and she promised me to have a prom positive influence there, and the um, parliamentary leader of the left group also promised this, which was different last year. So hopefully drinking water will be allowed one day, and I will uh, li live to see the day. And that's good because we want to have you for longer. And then there are, of course, some questions about the new coalition and maybe uh, what you can do in cooperation with them, maybe. So, introductory question What, in your view, are the differences in digital politics between the left party and the Greens and the FDP, the Liberals? And are these unsurmountable or is that something where you could maybe work together and, and uh, try to achieve the same goals because you have the expertise maybe maybe you have common goals well there are with any other party in the coalition common things and differences with the uh, SPDs the social democrats the large differences are probably in terms of security not all of them think like Saskia Esken who is more compatible with us there are SPD politicians who uh, are more like Söder or Seehofer, so more conservative, and they also want to do hackback and things like that. So that's the issue there. With the Greens, uh, we're probably compatible on the subject of sustainability. When being oriented towards the public good, it's going to be a bit more difficult and a huge problem with the Liberals, with the FDP, and they say the market is supposed to handle this, and we see that the market doesn't handle this. We see this with education, with health, with uh, fiber, optics uh, networking and i think in other subjects here the fdp is going to be the break man and so we have to see first what is going to come there they uh, announced a lot of intentions about this very digital new government i was very concerned that the new chancellor's office just handed away all the tasks about digitalization and i expected that they would um, build out the resources they had so what couldn't be done before out of lack of resources that they would add some power there because in every ministry or which is called a resort in the government in each of them there's a lot of digitalization which you can't um, operate out of it but you have to see that even in the capacity to divide these resources um, where they have to be compatible with digitalization about common goals, common standards, common processes. So this has to work together. And you see you have a lot of projects, but no project program management. You don't have decent monitoring, no common strategy. And I don't see how this is supposed to change now under the new coalition. This was my first large frustration that they um, 
blocked any kind of uh, leadership there where you have um, where you could have the leadership in the chancellor's office and they decide against it and I thought that was a bad idea but still it looks overall uh, for digitization I'm not going to uh, be silent about it it does look better than before so a lot of things that I fought for for a very long time are now at least in the coalition agreement but I am still a bit cautious because in the previous coalition agreement and in the one before and in many of the state ones they wrote the nicest things and then uh, they didn't happen or they happened differently so we still have to watch out yeah you just you just mentioned that the liberals uh, in some of the issues that you find important and many of other viewers probably find important the fdp is the ones on other ones on the breaks and the liberals are now uh, in the transport ministry which also also see digitalization industry he used to call himself a friend of the car drivers what do you think of him oh i haven't met him before so nothing he is nothing that has anything to do with digital so i've looked him up of course on the search engine of my short choice i mean it said financial politic um tax politics and then uh traffic politics and also agricultural politics so digitalization is supposed to be everywhere in there but this person doesn't hasn't had it as their subject really so far i don't really know what i can expect from there it's the first signals that came out of the new government they have been the worst so uh regarding um data retention data, data retention yep. yeah in the coalition agreement it still was pretty vague and i thought well they will still keep it but the um law minister said no that's going to be abolished which would be very nice if it happens how the traffic minister who has now the digital stuff in the name at the beginning how we will have to watch out that he already made two statements where he put a strong focus on the digital things and it didn't sound too bad so let's give him his 100 days and then we will see but with um bandwidth um, expansion i'm very skeptical which is where i believe in the power of the communal expansion and i don't think the concert uh, companies can do this very well so let's see what the ftp does you mentioned telecommunications data retention there was a question on that what do you think about quick freeze is that a sensible compromise is it bullshit well quick freeze is not uh, saving things for no reason but it is saving things for some reason so i have a certain person for a certain reason uh, under suspicion for a certain time and i want to i might not be able to prove it yet because um things are still going on but i want to make sure that the data is not vanishing because the um communication companies will only save data for a few days i think this makes some sense if it's limited to a certain reason the main problem we always had is that it's supposed to be saved for everyone for no reason so if this goes away that's already a good thing uh, the signals so far are not that great but the government is also um fairly new you have to uh, acknowledge it and that but the digital services act of the european union is starting to uh, take shape on the subject of cookies or um ads that are based on your uh, behavior and i think those ads based on behavior are a very dangerous thing to all of us because an incredible amount of including incredibly sensitive data for all of us is being collected and we don't even know what happens to this data this is in theory uh constant um gdpr violation and we have to act against this on the european level and we this can only be possible with a ban of um this kind of ads and i would like for our federal government to be very active and vocal against this and i have not seen that yet there are some other questions about the general frustration tolerance that you need in parliament the question how you actually work with the lack of digital competency do you have any ideas of what you would like to push 
and what your colleagues in Parliament, uh, across parliamentary parties and groups, how they could be, become more enthusiastic about these issues. How can the awareness of digital politics or digitalization can be increased and what lobbying might be necessary? So lobbying work is in the digital sector being done very well for a few years now. Especially that certain things with a specific wording were found in the coalition agreement is due to very effective lobby work. So the suggestions that came from the CCC, but also some others such as the F5 um, uh, association also had an impact. All of us um, members of parliament get something there during the electoral fight and it was for some of us the first thing we dealt with these subjects. So this makes some sense and keeping it short um, and brief makes a lot of sense because what we don't have a lot of as members of parliament is time and what we have a lot is information overflow. So we have thousands of pages, then we don't have time to read it. If it fits onto a single page, then a lot of people might have still time to um, take it in. And otherwise, I think the most effective um, work can happen within a parliamentary group itself. So for a long time, within my own parliamentary group, I uh, had some complaints and then eventually I was allowed to do a presentation internally. But I think we need this for all parliamentary groups. There are too many members of parliaments who say, oh, I'm an agricultural politician, I'm a traffic politician, I'm all of this. And digitalization is only going to be done by the network politicians. And that's not how it should work in a digital society. Everyone has to understand that it can't be like this. And we noticed this in the last legislative periods as well, because between us, in a lot of subjects, the differences were a lot smaller than between the different parties and also between smaller than possibly within our own parliamentary group. So the network politicians could have one position there which was compatible, compatible uh, between us, such as upload filter, representatives of all parties found that was a bad idea. But if the parliamentary groups, which ha have the majority, when they don't understand this and they just um, fall for three lobby lines, which some old industry uh, dictates to them, then you have a problem. So you need, I would almost like to uh, have an obligatory digitalization training, but um, network politicians of all countries should be active within your parliamentary groups and educate your colleagues and the civil society can also do their part. Okay, um, maybe three short questions. We have actually passed a lot of time. Uh, what do you think about uh, small mini electrical vehicles, uh, skateboards, uh, things like that. Do you believe it's just e-cars that are needed on the streets? But what about others? Well, with electronic mobility, I am already annoyed for a while. And I think that's also in the coalition agreement that it's focused on cars. And it should, for instance, also look more towards uh, bicycles. If it needs to include skateboards, electric ones, I wouldn't go that far, but definitely bicycles. Uh, so um, bicycles with which you can carry broader loads are also important. But also I think pedestrians should play a large role, which are also always forgotten. But, well, the health ministry now can employ more IT security people, perhaps with the new minister in place. A short answer? In the last days before Christmas, Karl Lauterbach uh, told me in the plenary and asked or asked me if I would be ready to work together with him uh, across party borders. And I said, yes, of course. And if there's going to be an appointment with him, then this will be one of the things that I will suggest um, to have more IT security people there. Also, you talked about the government uh, parliament cloud. Can you briefly say what software is used there, the one that's not working? How does it work? Maybe it was, could things change there? Well, I don't know how the telephone conferences work, which services they use there, but this is being uh, redone anyways. And there's currently no 
a lack of solutions. So for video conferences, we have used a lot of WebEx in the uh, Digital Commission, for instance. There are a lot of licenses there now. We still work on having a messenger with which you can uh, separately, securely talk with one another. So there should be an extra wire messenger being set up there. And I think there was another partial question. Yes, the cloud. The cloud is so terrible because it keeps, if you are working together with a person, which a lot of people do, and then someone updates something and you see it, and then the other person opens and closes the dock and the new thing is there. But when I do it the next day, and it's all gone. And this is, of course, very unfortunate. So it is not funny and has caused a lot of grief already. But that doesn't matter now because this is going to be redone. We get a new cloud. They've asked me, for instance, if I have a hint or if someone has a great hint what you should use or what you should recommend to the Bundestag IT. I don't know. If I have used the, seen these systems. I don't know if it's well done, but we have to come to the end. This was very, very interesting. Of course, I know many of these things, but I, I'm supposed to tell you a lot of applause and love from the chat to you and for your work. And I'm very glad to hear all that. Uh, of course, I'm very close. Uh, I know how much passion uh, he's suffering puts yeah. into that yeah because these are husband and wife talking right now or wife and husband i should perhaps say uh now talking about uh, the legacy website of Anke has a, an expired certificate i was told and this has been repaired as this was said sorry about that and thank you uh, and I am also supposed to tell you that uh, after this, the stage at Chaos Zone will feature a spontaneous zone chaos with the radio crew of the Chaos Computer Club of Potsdam. Great people, all of them, and uh, this is all great. And uh, you should stay with us and see that and stay healthy. And thanks to Anke. And um, thank you for me too. And if there was any question that you weren't able to to, to pose, please contact me, anke.domscheidberg.de with the new certificate. We'll give you all the details. Goodbye.